thanks for coming. Um, how many people know who uh, Marion King Hubbard, M.K. Hubbard, is? Okay, some of you do. All right. Um, for those who don't know who he was, he was a um, petroleum geologist who, works for, who worked for various number of companies, and then he worked for the USGS. And uh, later in life, he, he uh, became somewhat of a philosopher. Um, but his, his prophecies were basically scientific in nature, not, uh, not spiritual. <clears throat> so those of you who do know Hubbard, who can tell me what was Hubbard's first prophecy? Um, and, and to be a prophet, of course, particularly at Cassandra, you have to, um, basically, you have to make a prophecy that nobody believes, um, but turns out to be true. Um, I know Eric knows. Anyone else know um, <laughs> what Hubbard's first prophecy was? Yes. Uh, I think it was peak oil in the U.S. Peak oil in the U.S. And when did he make the prediction? Uh, like, I, when peak oil would be? Well, when he made the prediction, oh, first of all. 68 or something. Okay, Eric already knows. In the 50s? Yeah, 56. 56. And yeah. when did he say that, that, that US, the oil would peak in the United States? 1970. Okay, so imagine <coughs> in the late 50s, this is like, um, what's that? Range. Right, a range, somewhere in that range, 69, 71. <clears throat> imagine in the 50s, this is the, this is the biggest economic boom in, in U.S. history. This is the, you know, aside from the 20s maybe, the 50s, when everything is just exploding, the economy is exploding, and he says that oil is going to peak in 1970. He was laughed off the face of the earth. He said, you are out of your mind. This, there's no way that that's going to happen. Um, well, the uh, red line is his prediction, and the green line is the, is the actual um, oil extraction in the United States. Uh, so you can see, uh, including Alaska, I believe, which he didn't uh, include. So, so um, he was pretty close. He hit the year um, almost dead on. And I think he said 200 billion, and the extra 20 all came from, I think mostly came from Alaska, which he did not include in his estimate. So um, if you don't know what the oil peak is, it basically means that any given well or, or large region um, is subject to a peak in extraction after which there's decline. Um, and uh, the other thing that is part of his... His theory is that when you hit the peak, you've extracted approximately half of the oil. So that doesn't mean that when you hit the oil peak, that oil has run out. It means that you've taken half of it. And the, the remaining half is much harder to get out because um, the, the, the net energy is much lower. Because when you first drill a well, if anyone has heard of the spindle top gusher in Texas, you drill a well into the ground, and then the oil starts just shooting out like a geyser under its own pressure. But then as you extract it, the pressure drops, and you have to, um, you know, it gets harder and harder to get the oil out of the ground. You have to go deeper and deeper into the oceans. Um, and so the second half is much harder. Okay. <coughs> but I don't want to focus on the oil peak because I want to get to his third prophecy. Okay, so, so what, was, uh, what was Hubbard's second prophecy? World oil supply. Right, world oil peak. And when did he say that would happen? Never. No. no. Hubbard? Hubbard said, uh, actually, he predicted around 1998, with it, prior to the OPEC oil embargo. So he didn't have, but he did say, actually, in this essay, that um, he said, if, if OPEC would restrict the supply, that the uh, peak would be delayed. He actually did say that, although he didn't. He didn't uh, have that information at the time he made his second, his second prophecy, which was the world oil peak. And I, I've overlaid these two curves to scale, uh, which is bar barrels per day. He did it in barrels per year. Um, and he predicted 98, and the actual oil peak had turned out to be um, sometime in the last five years or so. So he was pretty close. And if you look at the actual, you can see that there was a peak in 2005, um, 2008. Um, this is a little out of date now. If you go up to 2011, it's, it's sort of gone down and back up again. So it's sort of this, this peak plateau. It's not a single point. It's kind of like a, a plateau. So that, uh, 
was the second prophecy, which has also turned out to be true. He was off by a couple of years, but not, not too far off, uh, as you can see. Yeah. So Gary, the very dramatic drop-off around 2009, yes. um, that represents that the supply hasn't been uh, consumed. Right. It represents the economic, the correct? Do, correct? So that when, as uh, the economy begins to falter along, there could be increased production because we haven't actually consumed all of it. So, right. <laughs> so what happened in 2008, there was um, stocks crashed, all, all the people with money put their money into commodities, drove the price of oil up to $147 a barrel, and then the, the economy crashed, and then the price of oil and demand, demand crashed with it, and then the price, of course, once the demand crashed, the price dropped back down. And now there's been a, like a slight uh, increase in, in demand again, driving the, um, uh, the supply back up again. But we're essentially in this, in this, this plateau. Okay, so now we come to the topic, really, of what I want to talk about, which is Hubbard's third prophecy. Um, now, how many people want to bet against Hubbard this time? <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's two for two. Um, his third prophecy, much less well-known, that a lot of people have heard about the oil peak. There's oil peak deniers, just like there's global warming deniers. Just in the 50s, you know, there were oil peak deniers. There's oil peak deniers now, you know, who say that the, the earth is filled with a gooey a nougat center of oil and uh, <laughs> you just have to go deep enough to, to extract it. And um, there's, uh, there's oil, you know, forever. But, um, okay, so Hubbard's third prophecy, which is contained in the article which was circulated. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, the, um, he points out that that the fossil fuel era is just a blip in time. It's a 500-year blip in time. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a transient phenomenon in human history, and therefore exponential growth is a transient phenomenon in human history that all, is only happening over this 500-year period of, during the consumption of fossil fuels. Okay, so um, his third prophecy um, has to do with the rates of growth of various things. Um, the bottom line being a, a non-renewable uh, resource, uh, all non-renewable resources follow the same graph, uh, extraction up to a peak and then decline. A renewable resource which can reach a certain level and be maintained. And then the, ex the exponential growth curve, um, which cannot be followed by any physical um, uh, resource for for an unlimited amount of time, um, can only be followed for an um, unlimited amount of time by non-material things such as money and debt, because it's just a number on a page or a or a uh, point, a data point on a in a computer. Money. Uh, I can read. I can read you his quote. The third curve is simply the mathematical curve of exponential growth. No physical quantity can follow this curve for more than a brief period of time. However, a sum of money being of a non-physical nature and growing according to the rules of compound interest at a fixed interest rate can follow that curve indefinitely. In their initial phases, the curves for each of these types of growth are indistinguishable from one another, but as industrial growth approaches maturity, <coughs> the separate curves begin to diverge from one another. In its present state, the world industrial system has already entered the divergence phase but it's still somewhat short of the culmination of the curve of non-renewable resources. And so what he says is, our principal impediments at present are neither lack of energy or material resources, nor of essential physical and biological knowledge. Our principal constraints are cultural. During the last two centuries, we have known nothing but exponential growth. And in parallel, we have evolved what amounts to an exponential growth culture a culture so heavily dependent upon the continuance of exponential growth for its stability that it's incapable of reckoning with problems of non-growth. And he concludes by saying, um, we need a serious examination of the nature of our cultural constraints and of the cultural adjustments necessary to permit us to deal with the problems rapidly arising, provided this can be done before unmanageable crises arrive there is a promise that we could be on the threshold of achieving one of the greatest intellectual and cultural advances in human history. 
So he's not a pessimist by any means, but he says we're facing a cultural crisis. And guess what? Here Take a look at New York City, okay? And it has to do with the difference in how money operates and how resources operate. So is there any evidence um, that this is what's happening? Well, look at total debt um, in the United States as a percent of GDP compared to the, the oil curve, the, the world uh, oil curve, okay? It looks very similar to uh, this graph that he drew. Um, and if we look at debt as a percentage of U.S. GDP, um, we see that in 2008 it was 350, 2009 uh, 370, 2009 late 425, uh, latest figure 475. Um, so, you know, no physical quantity can do that. And what happens to to curves that look like that? They don't go like that forever. They um, they eventually they eventually drop back down. Um, and the other thing that and I would contend that this divergence between money and, and oil happened in 2008, when you know when we had the uh, the financial crisis. That was sort of the the, the moment when that crisis became apparent um, in the difference the way money operates and the difference the way uh, oil, which runs the whole economy, operates. Um, the other thing that's important is that our entire money system is based on debt, and one of the things that Hubbard did mention is one of the characteristics of of all the money in circulation being based on debt with interest due, not just when, you know, all the money that's in circulation has interest due, <clears throat> means that there is a huge transfer of wealth from the bottom 80% to the top 20%. So the, the, the debtors basically are transferring money to the creditors, and that's inherent in the entire money system. Um, so that's another issue of inequality, which is a key issue that's being faced globally right now. And it's structural to the way money is created. It's not just a sort of superficial thing, oh, well, you know, you, you all borrowed too much money. Um, no, it's based on the whole structure of the way money is created in the first place. Money is created as debt. So even if you haven't, if you're not in debt at all, you're still being screwed. Yeah, right, because there's a constant inflation, there needs to be constant growth, and due to the constant inflation, your, your, the value of your, your money is constantly declining. So even if you have no debt, you're still affected by this. Um, okay, so as I said, no, no uh, curve can go up like that forever. Eventually, they all drop. This is what happened in 2008. So what did we do to compensate for the, the drop of, of, of you know, housing and finance? <laughs> And, and oil prices and so forth, we, we took on more money. debt, right? <laughs> to, to paper it over, right? So we just papered it over with more debt, um, which is unsustainable. And uh, so what can be done? Well, um, some economists way back in the 1920s said we should stop letting, well, way before that, um, the colonists actually issued um, government credit money instead of debt money. This has been a 400-year battle going on between the banks and government over who has the right to issue money. Um, the Franklin and the colonists issued uh, colonial scrip. Um, the early uh, founders spoke against bank money. Uh, Jackson shut down the second bank. He, he, um, he paid off the debt for the only time in U.S. history by abolishing uh, central bank money. Um, Lincoln uh, printed greenbacks, you might remember, which were government interest-free money. Um, and then Kennedy began uh, issuing treasury notes that were not Federal Reserve notes. So, um, and then in the 1920s, starting with uh, Frank Knight and also Frederick Soddy, they suggested 100% reserve requirements, which would eliminate the ability of banks to create money and that the, the government should issue credit directly without borrowing it from a bank. Um, so the second, the second part, so 100% reserve would eliminate banks creating money, then to get rid of the Federal Reserve uh, and Federal Reserve notes. So remember, the, the federal government has to borrow money from the Federal Reserve and pay interest, and also to foreign governments, um, rather than just issue, instead of issuing um, treasury bonds, they could just issue treasury notes, which are interest-free. 
Um, same thing as greenbacks. That's at the federal level. Another thing that could be done, and this is, there's a lot of talk about this, there's public banking groups springing up all over the place. I just heard today that public banking was demand number four of Occupy Wall Street. You can do this at the state or local level, um, issuing local currency, complementary currencies. Um, California did it with warrants, zero interest bonds. Bills of credit are not allowed by the federal constitution, but um, states did issue a currency way back when. Um, there's the idea of social credit. Instead of giving the banks a $12 billion bailout, how about giving it directly to the population? Let them spend it into the economy. It, will actually de develop, it would actually create demand as opposed to giving it to the banks that, didn't, uh, that just take it and trade it around the world in, in, uh, in speculation. And there's actually a bill in Congress, believe it or not, that does all these things. It's called the, the NEED Act, um, proposed by Dennis Kucinich. The, the way money works and the way resources work are incompatible, and that eventually that money curve is going to have to snap back to reality. And they're the two, uh, the way we issue money and the way resources work, particularly oil, are going to have to be brought back into line, um, and we're going to have a cultural crisis uh, until we do that. And I would contend that's exactly what's happening now. So um, I would not want to bet against Hubbard. Let me just check if I understand what this means, though. Uh, basically, if you've got a retirement fund or money in the bank, even though you're not speculating madly, uh, inflation is going to erase it? Is that the basic idea? It's going to raise it? E erase it. It will. It's all, Well, if you look at the value of uh, the dollar now compared to, say, 20 years ago, it's, it's constantly shrinking, right? dollar in, in the 1970s worth like 20 cents now, right? Yeah. So it's all, why is the money always, def always deflating like that? Because of this, because of our debt-based money system. Why is there any reason, there's, um, no, I'm, not arguing that. You know, no, I'm saying there's no reason why money needs to constantly decline in value like that. That's, a, that's inherent in our structure of our money system. Okay, but to get from where we are now to the solution, right? doesn't that mean we basically have to deflate all kinds of of savings and retirement funds. I, I'm not saying that. I just want to know what it means, you know, to me or to you. Yeah. yeah. I mean deflate or inflate because it's inflation confusing. induces the value. Right. right. It's confusing. Deflate when increases. All oh, right. All oh, right. But I mean, right. it's confusing. Right. So when the money becomes point. worth less, okay. that's so, what. So, so what we're talking. About. But the hit is going to be yeah. massive inflation relative to what we know. The hit? No, there should be less less inflation in the money and and. Like I say, it's confusing. There won't be there won't be no investment. The difference will be instead of banks, which what they do now is they create money out of thin air. What they will do then is they will only be loaning out money that people put on deposit. That's okay, what, that's okay, what people okay, think. Fine, that's fine, how they think it works. But I'm just, it seems as though the uh, expectations of my generation and certainly the baby boomers and so on is that. What they've been putting up, all based on this exponential growth model, is theirs to use for retirement or whatever. And I'm getting the message that it's phony money. It's phony money. Funny money. So well, not all of it. I mean, okay, but what about half of it? In other words, okay. I mean, if, look, if, the, if nothing's going to happen to my bankroll, I think I'll, uh, you know, go back to sleep. What's what's the problem uh, for me? But you're getting that devaluation of the currency, right? I mean, you're talking yeah. about taking a whole lot of spending power, which banks generate, out of the economy. Well, except ultimately, that a lot of it, the problem is much of it, in fact, most of it is based on speculation rather than investing in real goods and services. You know, like a forest can grow at something like 3% a year, you can get... But it still creates spending power that's translated into yachts and Which is transferred and into houses. people's investments accounts, is yeah. what you're saying. But that's, uh, a lot of it's paper money. Yeah. So Bob's yeah. saying a lot of that paper money people are counting on someday right. to cash in and, and retire on. And I'm just trying right. to you know what the signal or the mechanism is going to be. I've got a, let's say I've got a bird in the backyard. Oh, what? <laughs> I've got my money... Sorry, okay. I went to the dentist. Yeah. I've got a loose lip right now. Yeah. <laughs> Looser than usual. Uh, <laughs> I've got the money buried in the backyard. Yeah. Paper money. Right. Uh, so nobody's going to be able to take it. So what's going to happen to it? 
to me, it, it is there's going to be inflation in such a way that it just doesn't buy me as much as it used to? Or am I totally okay. cool? Okay, some people say that when you run up a huge debt like that, the only way you can pay it back is to make the, is to make the money um, worth much less by, by uh, inflating the currency. In, the short, in other words, printing yeah. so much more yeah. money right. that it becomes much less. And in that case, your investment will be worth much less. Okay, well, yeah. I, I guess my question is... And the other way is to default. So there's three ways to pay off a debt like that. Either inflate the money drastically. People talk about hyperinflation. Number two, default. And number three, um, you know, basically just say, we have um, more weapons than you, come and get it. You know? <laughs> okay, so if I have a, a lot of bonds and so on, they could just evaporate. They could evaporate. If I've got it Anything that's a paper, that's a paper asset could evaporate in value. If it's a real asset, like, you know, you own physical um, metals or some real, like an apartment building or a house, that will never lose its value. But anything that's measured in paper could become worthless. Okay, but there's two ways to measure. Sorry to push this, but you, you can measure in paper and then you get a statement from your stockbroker telling yeah. you what you own. Right. That's one kind of paper. Yeah. And he can just write you next month and say, oh, by the way, all your stocks just dropped by 90%. Right. Second is I have them. Currency buried in my backyard. It's yes. still paper, but it's right. tangible. Right. The way I'm going to get nailed on that is from inflation. Well, like you think of um, you know, Weimar Germany, they had to use yeah, yeah, wheelbarrows full of cash to get to you know to buy a roll of toilet paper, okay. that kind of thing, where your money becomes worthless because it's been you know it's been inflated so much. Okay. But and that could happen too. Or right. some other thoughts. Isn't it required for it to happen? Required to pay this off? Yes. Probably. Yes. Just yeah. to open up, the, there was a few hands that people wanted to chime in. Oh, the government tip bonds, uh, those are paper. Yeah, but they're, what? Uh, the government tips, treasury inflation yeah. protected bonds. Okay. Uh, they're paper, but they're theoretically infl and protected against inflation. So uh, that, uh, I think, would uh, theoretically protect your, your assets. Assuming that the U.S. government remains solvent and... and, uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, honored, its, honored, right. its, honored its, its, its obligations, and some of us question whether the U.S. will remain solvent. I mean, it's only worth, right, money is trust. You trust. The U.S. has never, that's why they were so concerned that their bond rating got reduced. The U.S. has always been AAA bond rated. <clears throat> Everybody's trusted it as the most reliable um, <clears throat> investment in the world. So everybody, when things get shaky everywhere else, everybody rushes into U.S. Treasury bonds because they're safe. But then they were they were just rated down downgraded by one of the rating agencies, and you know it's based on trust. So do you trust the federal government? <laughs> you know some people think that it's a, it's an empire in decline and that it's over ex extended its reach, and that it cannot afford <clears throat> to to pay off its debts. And and if you look historically, <clears throat> they say um, that. Federal government debt, <clears throat> not including all those others that I showed you, just the federal portion, um, government, the black line, has reached <clears throat> about 100% of GDP. And people will say, oh, well, it was much higher during World War II. But remember that after World War II, there was this huge economic expansion that allowed them to pay that debt off. Now, according to Hubbard, if you don't have more oil, you can't have the same kind of economic expansion unless you have find some other source of energy. But um, like, I, it seems like it, what you're saying is that the, our economy and our the debt based system is on the crumbling foundation of oil and of also of other resources too. But it just seems to me that there are that doesn't always need to be as much tied to this foundation as it is because I mean I. Because I don't know, like I just looked up on the computer with some, some numbers I looked up, and um, in 2005, like Walmart wanted to reduce the mileage of their trucks, and their goal was to reduce it by 25 percent within like a few years or whatever. They ended up reducing it by like, 38 percent. They hoped to double it by 2015. You're talking about gas consumption, gas consumption? diesel trucks, diesel. and then they had the largest truck fleet in the country. Where is this? The Walmart. They, re they, they reduced it, and they want their goal was 25 percent. They reduced their mileage for diesel trucks. It reduced it. Right. So what, you're, so what you're talking so about? They're improved, improved by 38 percent. So what I'm saying is, um, is that there are. I mean, you hear about all these other, you know, there's so many other things, even like the, the cradle to cradle stuff, that we can get ourselves less dependent on fossil fuels. I know like technology isn't always a big cure all, but there are like some things out there. So I'm saying is, um, are we? Do you think we are like as connected to oil as 
we think we are, or do you think these all these other thoughts and ideas and technologies are? Because some stuff we never even really no, never I, thought about or re-engineered it until now. So right. Like, oh. No, we we right now we are tied into oil right. currently. But do you think the future? But the whole what Hubbard was saying was no. We have the ability. We have we, we have the technology and yeah. the knowledge to move to a solar-based economy. Now, how long will that take? It might take a while. And how much money would that cost is the other thing. Because we're in a place right now where you can't get credit for anything. Right, so but, the, but with credit, yeah, well, with, but with public credit money, it's a whole way new of thinking, way, new way of thinking. But we don't have that. We, we, if we had, well, once we do, <laughs> that's not a problem anymore. You can, you can also Just argue. assume we had public credit money. You can also, that's a different problem. question. Yeah. You can also argue with that, that we're putting so little money to things like solar right now, that if we had to, we put a lot of our resources to it, we get results pretty quickly. And we'd be taking those resources away from not. something else. We could be taken away from stuff we don't really need. But to answer your question, you're talking about decarbonizing the economy, yeah, which is I'm happening. Talking more about and like CO2 per unit of GDP is declining, even in the United States. So we are decarbonizing our economy as we speak, like you said, we are. But how quickly can I mean, we still produce um, over half of our electricity <coughs> from coal. 98% of our transportation is based on petroleum. Um, we convert 10 units of oil into one unit of food. We are so totally dependent on fossil fuels for our entire economy that it isn't going to happen overnight. Particularly transportation and food, and I believe those are the two uh, most critical areas um, because our food supply is completely dependent on oil and so is our transportation. So that's, there was that's a, a few problem. comments in the yeah. John. But I just to finish, I don't, and this is where I differ from many other people, I don't think that electricity is a problem. I think we have many other ways to produce electricity, and we can we can diversify our electrical supply, supply very quickly. Um, England did in 10 years, got completely off coal and went to natural gas, but so that's just an example. In 10 years, completely transformed their electrical supply. But transportation and food, not a way. Uh, two things. First, did everybody sign ISIS's birthday, <laughs> birthday card? Who didn't sign the card? Everybody did? Yeah. That's nice. um, so the second thing, we've we got a really good concrete example of what you're talking about right now in Iceland. So you, you, someone said earlier, well, you know, I mean, countries default all the time. <laughs> Greece would default if Europe didn't bail it out. Spain, Portugal would default if Europe didn't bail it out. It looks like Italy, you know, could be on the same path. Um, the countries default all the time. And if you take the long view. And Iceland well, said, we're not paying the So bank. Iceland said, look, we're not paying you. The citizens got together, they voted, they said, we're not paying right. We didn't the bank. create that debt, we're not going to pay it. Right. But Iceland also didn't sort of tank as an economy. They're doing okay. They've maintained their social programs. They, if, if, if anything, they've increased their social safety net. Why? Because they're not dependent on fossil fuels as much as we are in other countries. The, 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 the vast majority of their electric grid comes from their own geothermal, their own hydro, etc. They're moving their liquid fuels away from oil to hydrogen that based on the electric grid, etc., etc. They are not this big sort of oil gobbling nation. Um, there are very few examples like that. So you're trying to connect the dots between debt and the energy resource. Um, that's one example of where they said, well, let's just wipe this debt off, and they had the, had the energy resource to fall back on. Um, and of course, the Iceland kroner is like, you know, who cares? <laughs> yeah, whereas the dollar, whereas the the dollar, dollar it's a game changer, dollar. right? Yeah. Now, Europe didn't come and run in and bail out Iceland like they're, gonna, like they're trying to do with Greece, like Portugal, like Spain, like, right? Because it was like Iceland kroner, who cares? 300,000 people, who cares? Uh, so they've wiped their debt, but they had a resource base to fall back on. I think but they haven't changed the money, their money system. No, but the big disconnect that you're trying to point out is, let's say we just said wiped our debt. Would we have, would we have the currency? Would we have the buying power to pull in the forty percent oil imports that come from elsewhere? Actually, or it's over sixty percent of that the sixty that we import now of our oil. In fact, back in the seventies, I you know I'm old enough to remember we said we'll never import this much oil again. Yeah. That was when we were importing thirty percent, and now we're importing sixty percent. Closer to 70, actually. Closer to 70? Okay. Well, that's it. Just so, going with John's um, premise, sort of, what you were, you know, if the U.S. did what Iceland did, 
I don't think we have the trust in our own government, in our own selves, to do what Iceland did. I mean, there was a, um, a, a body politic, I believe, in Iceland that was able to hold the center that I'm not sure the U.S. has. Well, in the outside world, they're saying, we're not going to... We're not, we'll never invest in Iceland again. Yeah. And Iceland's again so small and insignificant, and such as they have their have their own energy resources. It's sort of like who cares? Mm -hmm. But in the U.S., that would be they have to they have quite to throw different. out two or three successive governments in order to get this to happen. Two again, governments, yeah. two governments, and then prosecute all of the fraud that was done by the financial mm -hmm. sector, right. which you obviously has not happened here. Mm -hmm. There were some uh, hands yeah. back here. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. That. I was just on the, I mean, we got, you're saying, I mean, it's full change to get rid of the, the Fed, but I mean, I don't really know if there's the willpower to get there, but could we get partway there if we only got to the point where the Fed would, it, all federal money was given debt free from the Fed. It was just the law that the Fed well, could not Well, they are giving debt free money to banks, that's, that's right. not to us. <laughs> But if it was right now, the interest rate that banks can collect can get from the Fed. They can get money at zero percent interest, and then they use it to loan out at, at interest and speculate and make money. So they're getting the banks are getting interest-free money, but we're not. We need to check that fact because that rarely happens. No, yeah, the banks is. actually go to the Fed. Well, I'm on. My understanding is that the Federal Reserve like rate is zero. It's, it's, but it's, that's very that rate term when they determines lots of other rates term term in the economy. Yeah. That's why it's important. But banks rarely go to the Fed. I mean, that's like when you're asking your parents for a loan in your in your sixties. Yeah. Well, that's secondary to my point. My point is that I mean, if we can't get all the way to the point where we can just get rid of the Fed or take over the entire money supply, can we just if we just got to the point where all money issued to the federal government was debt free? Or issued by the federal government, or you mean by the Fed? So if all our T-bills were just 0%, if we didn't have to pay... But then we wouldn't be able to get any money from anyone else, um, like from China and Japan, who are the two biggest, or from U.S. citizens. Uh, the Fed only you know, buys a small portion of the yeah. T-bills. I mean, much of it's coming from foreign countries. That's the appeal of T-bills, is that people look at that as an investment, because they're going to get paid interest. But if those are interest-free, why would anybody invest in T-bills? It's completely unnecessary, because the government can issue credit by itself. And it's done so <coughs> many times in history. We've all forgotten this. We all think, oh, the federal government, to get money, has to borrow money. No, it's not true. The federal government can issue credit. It says right in the Constitution, in the 14th Amendment. Um, you had your hand up first, though. Well, so many questions. Um, at the uh, monetary uh, working group the other day, I think you said that there are something like 800 billion actual cash dollars in the economy. I think that was Brian actually Brian was talking about that. Okay, so and if it's we, like two percent of the total money supply. The rest is is, is you know in, in digital. Digital, yeah. So if we had 100 percent reserve requirements, would that mean that effectively the only money that existed would be cash money, that 800 billion dollars, and any credit created by governments or. Any credit could, credit could also be created by governments. It wouldn't have to be bills. So instead of leaving it up to the banking system, you know, yeah. because and most of the money in this economy comes from <laughs> banks making commercial loans. Okay, so my other big question um, is: I'm getting this picture that with the banks being able to get a hundred dollars, loan ninety, get the ninety back when the person deposits the money in the bank. Then loan another eighty one yeah, out. Sort of this is cycle. Multiple yeah. layering yeah, right. of it's a cycle. of by creating money mm -hmm. in that way. Right. There's um, there's a, there's a sense that the the banks by controlling that money are and then charging interest for it are demanding an awful lot of money to come into the system that stays in the coffers of the banks. And this way you get this mushrooming of money at the upper echelon of corporations. Well, it's this curve right here. I yes. Mean, the, the, the creditors make all the money, the debtors pay So all. what I want to know is, is there a boundary between the 100% reserve requirement and the present, what is it, 10% reserve requirement? Uh, less, like five or six. And, and in fact, Bernanke says it should be zero. <laughs> okay, so what I'm asking you, in terms of your concerns about the banking system and the exponential growth of money, is there a boundary between 100% uh, and 0% where 
The banks could charge interest, but it could not grow exponentially because it wasn't a large enough portion of the economy. I can't answer that, but I can tell you that when you have a money system based on debt, that the, econ the entire economy has to grow because you have to make the economy bigger to, to develop the surplus to pay back the interest. So it's structural in the system that the economy must grow to pay back the interest that's um, charged when the money is created in the first place. Even so, when it's 100% reserve? Yeah, because there's two different interests, we're two different issues we're talking about. The issue of interest is one thing. The, in the issue of reserve requirements is something else. And you can disconnect these completely and look at them individually. Well, but it would be a much smaller problem with 100% reserve because the, the government, the most of the money issued would not be, actually all the money issued would not be um, charged interest. The only interest would be charged on money that was already created beforehand and that was now being put in a bank to be loaned out. But, the, you know, it's completely different. The easiest way to understand this is to think about Lincoln. Okay, Lincoln wanted to, you know, fight the Civil War. The, the New York bank said, we'll loan you the money at 25 to 30 percent interest. He said, forget that, I'm going to just issue greenbacks, which he did, interest free, paid everybody with it, and then collected it back in taxes. And that, those were actually circulating, I've heard, until 1970. So that second part of your statement that you got to emphasize, collected it back. Well, yeah, because money has to, has to cycle. It can't just accumulate, right. it has to and cycle back. You say back. you pay back interest with growth, but you can also pay back interest with less consumption in the future. Which is what yeah, taxes yeah. Does. Or, or with taxes, yeah. You're yeah. basically saying we are going <laughs> but you're going to have to consume less. Right, but at a hundred percent reserve, there is no interest on the money creation itself. You can loan money. You can still have banks loaning out money, but that money was already created with no interest. So there's two different issues. Banks will still loan money. They will loan money that people put in the bank, or like a CD. Okay, a CD. You put it in, you can't touch it. Right now, you mentioned you, they take the hundred dollars, they loan out ninety. Okay, I can still take that hundred out. So now there's a hundred and ninety, where there was a hundred before. They just created ninety dollars out of thin air. Whereas in, in this hundred percent reserve system, you put that hundred dollars in, you can't touch it. It's a certificate of deposit. They can loan it out, but it's on a certain period of time. You can't touch it while it's being loaned out. That's the difference. People, that's how people think the banks work now, but they don't. I think Julia is. <laughs> um, can you go back to the what can we do? Uh, right. Have you ever gone through to look at kind of different groups of people and how these individual acts would kind of change the way that they look at life? I think of my parents who are on fixed income, and if you were to suddenly tell them that, well, your your money is going to be worth half of what it was, and there are a lot of people that are in that situation. So I'm just wondering. Are there steps that you can take to gradually get there? Uh, are there? Well, there actually, the, the, in this system, there, the, your money would not be constantly declining in value. That's the situation now. Just look at the, the, the value of a dollar in, in 1970 and the value of a dollar now. It's worth like a quarter. So the, in, in this system, money would not be constantly declining in value. But you said also that if there's a certain amount of money that's currently in the bank that someone thinks that they're going to be able to live off of, that that is no longer going to be as large as it was? If, if, this, I... if this system, when it does come to a stop, which it will because it, it's not sustainable, there will be a, there will be a certain crisis, there will be a credit crunch. And mm -hmm. it may make people's paper assets worth less in, during the transitional period. Look at mm -hmm. you know, what happened in the Soviet Union. Um, so <laughs> during that period, if we had a public credit money system, money would never be, would never, would, wouldn't be going down in value all the time like it does now. Right, but I mean, if you're living on a fixed income and thinking that that money's going to be... I don't know what's going to happen in, you know, in between. I okay. just think that, that that debt cannot be paid and there will be a default. Right. And, that, and, and, and if one of the ways that you can pay off a default is hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, your paper assets become worth much less, which is why people are now investing in gold and silver and things like mm -hmm. that, because right. they don't trust the, the money supply. Mm -hmm. Tom, you have some money to jump in. I have a question. So I'm, I'm just struggling to understand. Are you saying there is a a necessary relationship between debt and peak oil? What Hubbard was saying, he was he wasn't necessarily saying that. He was saying that that the two um, growth curves are incompatible. That that money can, can grow exponentially and debt can grow exponentially, which a physical resource can't do. And that you can have a money system that looks like this, 
Um, as long as, like down here, oh, you where the, the two curves are are, are yeah, together, then they're the, the two the two systems are compatible. Yes. He's saying that once they start to diverge, then you have a problem. Once you move past that inflection point, that's this farther point. you move past that inflection point, the, the two more curves and more start trouble. to diverge, and that the two systems are not compatible because money is non-physical can grow exponentially. Oil can't. So I mean, what I'm thinking is an alternative scenario. So when I think of public debt, that's a result of you know, uh, like of federal government. Debt. Federal government. Yeah. I, it, that's a result of uh, taking on deficits. It's deficit spending. That's right. how it happens. Right. So under under you know hypothetical alternative. Uh, uh, regimes, it could have been Republican, Democrat, or an independent party, uh, there may have been, and, and a Congress that cooperated, there, there could have been a completely different set of decisions uh, and, and no deficit spending, no significant deficit spending approved. Right. So in this exact same economic environment, right. or in other words, in the exact same uh, oil environment, yes. we could be right where we are right now with, with, no, no, debt. with no debt, no public debt. But that, that's because a I guess, small portion of I guess what I'm saying is it, the, the debt, the public debt, is a political decision. Right? It, so this is why I was asking whether there is a necessary relationship yeah. between debt and peak oil, and I don't see it because... But it's only public debt. It's only a it's third only a, of yeah. total debt. Yeah. The, but see, the public debt is the green, so uh, the green is the federal government debt. The, the rest is Less all the other kind of debt. Who's the red one? The red one is the financial sector. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got... And yellow? But that's a really good question. Is there a necessary connection? Um, and who's to say well, I don't that think debt wouldn't have gone elsewhere as well? Like, the government didn't take on that debt. Those That same debt could have been taken on by another sector because the needs were not fulfilled. That's I think the other thing, the other way to look at it, too, is that Another variable here is people's expectations. You know, people have this expectation of a certain standard of living. If the government decided not to take on that new debt because that, that the money that was created was spent to the economy and turned into GDP, we would see a lower GDP now than we would with that debt. Mm -hmm. And so you can certainly get by without issuing new debt, but you're going to pay for that with a reduced standard of living. And so that's how I that's how I think maybe Hubbard envisioned those two being related is that you can allow money creation or debt to track resources, but in the face of a steadily rising population, that translates directly to reduced standards of living. Whereas if you can keep exponentially increasing that money supply, then to an extent you can increase people's standards of living for a while, even in the face of leveling, leveling off of resources. But Gary, your point too is that how that debt is structured through banks lending money into existence through the required reserve ratio basically sets up the stage for all the other debt. Right? Well, I mean, if you went to a 100% reserve ratio requirement, that doesn't only put the clamp on federal debt, it puts the clamp on private debt, like big time. Just so you know, it's very simple to, uh, to figure out how much money is created based on the reserve rate. It's the one over the reserve rate. It's the inverse of the reserve rate. So if the reserve rate is five, is to say it's, it's five percent, one over 0.05 is twenty. So plus so excess reserves. Okay. There's a lot of excess reserves right now. Okay. So <laughs> I didn't know about that, but reserve plus excess reserves. <laughs> okay. So basically, for every any any money that's actually um, on deposit, they can create the banking system creates twenty times as much. Yeah. Okay. All right. If you go back to that other. Which one? The, the one with the 1950, where the two correlate and then split oh, off. Oh, yeah, right here. Because I think this was interesting in terms this of... This one? But yeah, because you look at the date, 1950 to 2000 is really where, you know, America starts to change its lifestyle against the rest of the world, hugely. Um, and if we had stayed at a very simple lifestyle, kind of in the 1950s, where they still aligned, then, to your point, um, you know, that expectation of making a million dollars in every family, you know, came out of this money growth system. Mm -hmm. We weren't there in the 1950s. People were still pretty moderate in their houses and their lifestyle expectations, mm -hmm. etc. But there was, you know, policy, governance, everything else that wanted that richness. It was the empire building. 
that ensued over the next 50 years. Well, you could argue that the federal debt, um, most of it came from military spending because, mm -hmm. you know, over 50 percent, taking, taking Social Security out, over 50 percent of U.S. federal government spending is for the military. So you could argue that the sort of uh, part of the, the necessary need to secure the oil supply, mm -hmm. that's one connection to the oil supply, is that, you know, the military that's used to protect the oil supply under the Carter Doctrine um, is, is responsible for a huge you know, part of the debt to maintain our current consumption level. And getting back to the, um, the debt, the other, that's the only direct correlation I can think of. Yeah, um, on, on the chart with the debt, what is it that changed in 40 or 50, I can't see the exact years, where then the, all of a sudden the financial sector Rose, what is what specific? Is there a specific oh, policy or? Yeah, well, you know, as we know, the financial sector has become a much bigger portion of the economy, and because of um, because of deregulation and also offshoring all of the manufacturing jobs. So, but also computers. Okay, but largely deregulation. I mean, deregulation, largely really since Reagan, starting things. in 1980, the philosophy of deregulation allowed the financial sector to you know to take over, and then offshoring all of the manufacturing jobs, and so the economy became much more, went much more toward the financial sector. But uh, did we have a 100% reserve requirement there when the we, financial sector had zero, did. basically no, no, zero? We, we never did, no. We never That's did. only one piece of the puzzle. Yeah. So, so who do you think should create the money then? Um, well, there's a lot, of, a lot of arguments that should be government at various levels, just local, state, federal government, or um, some people say we should go back to free banking, where, where people, banks can create their own uh, system, but just the, the, the main problem is that we have, I mean, the founders were aware of this. They put it in the Constitution that the government should coin the money, and there's been a long-running battle between private money and, and government money um, that's been going on for hundreds of years. Just because my thought is, if you have the government create the money, well, I'm afraid we get caught up in all, like, self-interest and everything, and politicians' self-interest and businesses' self-interest and everything. So I'm kind of like, if you have someone else create the money, well, that was the gotta, idea. somehow you're going to have to insulate it from all this other stuff. Well, see, that was the so, idea of the yeah, Federal yeah, Reserve, yeah. And, what, and, and how good a job have they done? Yeah. So people are like, oh, well, the federal government's going to screw it up. Well, do you, has the current system done any better? I'm just wondering, yeah. can, can we guarantee something better? Or? Well, there's no guarantees, um, but the argument that the federal government will do a worse job than the, the government. than the Federal Reserve will do, and the Federal Reserve, it was set up and that was with that reason in mind, let's put it outside of politics, let's, let's make it independent. And what did they do two years ago? They gave $12 trillion to foreign banks to bail them out. So yeah, I hope you're not arguing to give this public credit system to Congress. <laughs> to give it to Congress? Well, yeah, who, with Congress has like a 9% approval rating. You know? <laughs> but so, you're on to an important point now. Yeah, people don't want to trust, they don't want to trust your, your, the government. Your public either. credit system is not, um, you know, the same criticism against the Federal Reserve is going to be yeah, people trust Congress this. even less than the Federal Reserve. So I mean, if you so merge monetary and fiscal policy, like you guys have been talking about in your working group, well, the problem is yeah. that we've lost trust in government. Government is us, but our government has been hijacked by the financial sector. So essentially, there's no difference between the financial sector and the government. If we were actually in control of our government, maybe in that case we could trust them. I don't trust the national government because it's too big. I would much rather trust, uh, a, you know, a local or state government that's closer to home. When we were on the gold standard, uh, there was no inflation at all. The money was backed by gold. Why couldn't we just go back to a gold standard? Many people have advocated that, but uh, remember there's a famous cross of gold speech because um, it limits the amount of credit, and it also puts the power in the hands of the people who own the gold. So it does have positive attributes. Um, you know, <coughs> it, it disciplines the money supply. You can't just oversupply, print an oversupply of money. But it, all, but it has the opposite problem. It restricts credit when you need it um, you know, to produce new goods and services. The problem now is our economy is, and financial transactions around the world, Brian touched on this the other day, something like 95% of all transactions in the world are speculation. Basically, making money from money. Using computers, in microsecond transactions, they see that the exchange rate between the yen and the dollar on the Japan commodities exchange is is and you know half a cent different than it is in London, and the computer makes it 
trying to mix the exchange like that. Now, what, what benefit is that to society? That's what 95% of the transactions are, just shuffling money around to make money. Um, and Winston Churchill, 100 years ago almost, said, the speculator, <clears throat> and my business school colleague will hate this, um, the speculator <laughs> profits in direct proportion to the damage done to society. And Keynes said that speculation is fine as a bubble on the ocean of, of, of commerce, but when the, when the bubble becomes the ocean, then, then we have a problem. So we have this financial sector that all it does is shuffle paper and, and, and you know, electrons through computers produces nothing of any value to society, and they are taking a huge proportion of the national income. And that's what the people in Wall Street are complaining about, is that the financial sector is, is siphoning off, they're basically parasites siphoning off due to the way the money system operates. Um, and it goes much deeper than just the financial fraud. It's, it's in, this is the whole point of Hubbard's third prophecy, is that it's structural to the way our debt system, all of our money is based on debt. And it doesn't have to be. It can be based on credit instead of debt. And you don't have to go into debt to, <laughs> to, um, to, to circulate money. Yeah, but I mean, when you're talking about the speculation, we have the issues of, of reserve requirements. We have the issues of interest. That's an, <laughs> an issue of regulation. It has nothing to do with interest. And it has nothing to do with reserve requirements. And there's a lot of issues in the financial sector. Oh, you mean sector. speculation? Yeah, the speculation stuff you're talking about. That's a function of what people are allowed to do. Yeah. And it's not connected to interest, and it's not connected to reserve requirements. Yeah. And I, I doubt true. that when Hubbard made that original graph, I think that... Well, he was talking was, about compound interest, which is, which is... And there's so many more ways to make money for money than that nowadays, with derivatives and, like you yeah. say, with speculation. There's so many more ways. He was just so talking was a, about compound interest. He said um, yeah. it can grow with compound interest. He didn't even imagine all the ways that the, the financial engineers, wizards on Wall Street have figured out how to make money from money. Yeah, we should go back and read um, Krugman's editorial from a few years ago about something like, let's make banking boring again. Because um, I, I, it's, it's like we really need to lead with that, because that's such a, we get so much more traction on you know, regu regulation of banks going back to the sort of banking era of the 60s and 70s before we just went to this wildness frontier mentality of the 80s and 90s that we're having so much trouble rolling back. And that, to Tom's point, public debt is a small piece of the larger pie. When you right. look at your graph there with the red piece exploding, that is a huge target mm -hmm. for reining, reining this nonsense in. And the green piece, the federal piece, is actually pretty yeah. small when you start right. looking at the full exactly. spectrum. Yeah, but that's, a, right. but that's an incremental, that's an incremental reform and changing the way oh, money you could do is sweeping reforms. reforms and Pardon me? Financial regulation, deregulation in 81, 82, 83 was sweeping reforms. But in the, the 90s, sweeping reforms in the, in the 90s as well under right. Clinton. Right. So kind of building on that, you know, you look at this graph of, uh, this is debt to GDP ratio, but I think if you just graphed um, GDP with the different sectors represented proportionately, the uh, financial sector would grow similarly. So if you were to try to sell to the American public that we're going to rein in the financial sector, that's effectively saying to the general American public, we're going to reduce GDP. How do you sell that? Or shift it to back to things that you actually make. Mm -hmm. So do you expect that as you reduce... So we got a lot of money on the sidelines right now that could go into ecological restoration, renewable energy development, roads, bridges, schools, education, public this, public that, right? All of that, all of that. GDP that's created from the speculation side can be shifted into that. For example, take Brian, the, the Kelly speculation tax, right? And take all that money and pour it into what Gary's talking about, spending money into existence. There's your shift. That's one, that's one example. Another one or two questions. Brad, I know you had your hand up a little while ago. And then maybe over here, because we do like to close that one formally and let folks that have to go to go, but then we always encourage folks to stick around longer. I think the reduction in GDP that you're talking about would actually be uh, a deflation and a reduction in prices. It would not be a reduction in the uh, number of goods and services, that, and it would not be a reduction in our standard of living. Uh, I, I don't know why, uh, why it wouldn't be that way. And just to add to that, I mean, that's the whole thought process behind having 
multiple indicators rather than just G GDP. And you've got to change, I guess, the goal that people have in mind, individually and in terms of the national, local governments. You know, that we're looking at a suite of indicators and that your general welfare might actually go up while GDP could go down. We've got to change that thinking. One last comment. Um, as far as regulation, back in the 30s, when this happened before, they put in a whole you know, suite of regulations that kept the system stable until you know, till the 80s, the Glass-Steagall Act and, and all these rules that, that regulated banking. Um, and that, did, that worked for a while, but I would say that, according to Hubbard, and I would agree that we're in a different, we're in a different era, and that just putting back regulations on the financial sector is not going to go far enough. That we have to change the way money is created. You've got to think about long and hard about your public credit solution because, because uh, I keep coming to what what are the checks and balances, right? Because you could run into the same problems absolutely with a public issuing credit left and right. Left and right. You can, the you can, and they have done it historically. If you, and if you merge that you power into the fiscal side, into the kind of politics, I mean, we have this semi-autonomous monetary system on purpose. The semi-autonomous nature of it over the last decade in particular, the Greenspan era was the beginning of it, really started to merge, 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 merge more and more of the president having the, the bat phone to Greenspan saying, yo, I need a favor. You know, that didn't happen as much in the past as it's had in the recent decades. And so that alignment between the president's agenda and the Federal Reserve's agenda has really happened, you know, big time in the last few decades. Um, yeah, that well, that check and balance right. system, no, still, we still right. need that somehow. You're absolutely right. The, the, the people don't trust the Congress any more than they trust the Fed. But there's two different types of money creation. There's bank money, and then there's Federal Reserve money. And those, so those two things need to be addressed separately, I think. Yeah. But you can also sell the whole sort of different levels, like a federalism of you know, the monetary system. And that's, that could be another way to keep the check. That, that, that makes me feel a bit better, is to have, to sort of think, think of it like that. But a lot of people don't think of money systems like that. Mm -hmm. So that's a hard thing to, to sell.